as chairman of this session, I will have the advantage of asking you the first question. I take that privilege. Uh, but you sort of started by saying equality exists and uh, what are the sources uh, uh, and is it really bad? Actually, I'm, it went through my mind, is, aren't there some advantages to inequality? I mean, isn't it stimulating? Uh, isn't it, uh, yeah, motivating that I know that, it's in, that inequality is possible? Because I can work harder and uh, make sure I get at the top. Yeah, well, that, that, that indeed is the incentives issue. But I think you're, uh, I, I'm certainly not sure that the economist's emphasis on incentives catches quite all that you have in mind when you talk about motivation. Uh, and uh, that has come up, it's one of the, valuable contributions of behavioral economics to our understanding of what's going on. Because uh, what is called reciprocity is the, the fact that, uh, which is apparently well established, although it's been disputed, that uh, if a company were to pay its workers better than other companies pay comparable workers, for similar tasks, the, the workers would work harder. Uh, in some sense, they're motivated. And that's not the, the sense that you get from, from this. Of course, you can see it's coming from the inequality. On the other hand, uh, economists always love to talk about equilibrium. The equilibrium with this situation is that all the employers pay their workers more, each trying to pay more than the other employers. But uh, if the employers are all running the same kinds of factories or, or, or jobs, then uh, you end up with equilibrium with all paying the same because as they pay more, uh, it makes labor more expensive. And I mean, the, there's a cost to paying higher wages, as well as the advantages of, of getting this reciprocity effect. So, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, as usual, there are pluses and minuses, some advantages, some Very good. I'll uh, open the uh, floor for questions. Please uh, take the microphones, uh, 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 and as uh, the MC indicated, uh, please state your name and, uh, if necessary, the institution where you come from. Yeah. Yeah, it's working. Thank you for a very stimulating talk. I'm Joshua Green. I'm one of the visiting faculty members here in the School of Economics. And I have a question for you about the idea of a guaranteed income. Um, some years ago in the United States, there was talk about a negative income tax. It was not ultimately adopted. Instead, the US ultimately move to an earned income credit where people who are, who are earning a certain amount of money but whose income is below a certain level are able to get, in some cases, a check back from the U.S. government if they file a tax return. What is your view about providing some sort of basic minimum income t to everyone, uh, not necessarily tied to having to go out and work. In your view, would there be very strong arguments against it in terms of work disincentives? And are there things that could be done in order to make this less costly as an economic phenomenon? Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Good question. I could go on for the rest of the day. Or? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, I, I'm uh, strongly in favor of a basic income, unconditional income to everybody. But uh, uh, it's certainly something over which economists dispute and there are very interesting arguments both, both ways. Uh, I, I will just mention one of these. Uh, one reason why I'm very much in favor of 
of that. And I go even more strongly. I, I am in favor of, of something that actually happens in, in Britain, not because it happens in Britain. And I, I think it only happened by accident in Britain. And the government wishes it wasn't so. But effectively, the marginal rate of tax at the very bottom of the income range is 100% in Britain because uh, people get uh, housing allowances which are uh, cut back as their income increases, more or less one, one for one. I simplify a bit that the, the, this is the effect, which is uh, obviously the complete opposite of the, the American tax credit scheme. Uh, we also have something like that in Britain, which uh, where the, the subsidy you get from government kicks in as you earn a wage. And the reason why I, I think this uh, very high rate of tax may be okay, but I was quite unable to persuade the other uh, authors of the Merleys Tax Review. So, so we've stuck to the conventional view that we should not have such a high marginal tax rate at, at, at the bottom. But the reason I favor that is because uh, the people who, who earn very low wages have a very low productivity. And I think there's quite a lot of evidence that a substantial number of them would rather work than not. Now this may be age dependent. So I, I, I think the, the argument is weaker for the under 20s and maybe under 25s. But uh, uh, granted that if you have explore a model in which people would like to do some work, and, and there's, there's evidence to, to support this, it looks like that. It's one interpretation of the fact that uh, you, you don't observe many people who work for only a few hours in, in the week. Uh, then you can deduce that uh, a, a very high 100% marginal tax rate at the bottom is right. And of course, uh, you, you need to have a, a basic income, uh, essentially to avoid poverty. Thank you. I have a second question there. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh Sir Melis, uh, thank you for your lecture. I'm uh, Shan Wang, a uh, professor from NTU. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, I think about income in inequality. I lived in the US. I know American like heroes. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, they're American heroes. They have a lot of wealth, but they put the wealth in good use. I mean, Warren Buffett doesn't consume a lot himself. So I think the key question is how the money is being used, whether the money is flowed into more productive use. That's probably a better, another perspective looking at it. I want to make a point on this because nowadays, with, uh, especially after financial crisis with the quantitative easing, we, I, I see this problem getting worse because all the money are chasing for financial gain, financial speculation, rather than investing in the real need of, uh, of, the, uh, of the real economy. And because of that, I think that the people here, a lot of young people here, they are suffering because they had the potential to make more money, to be more prosperous, more productive, but that with the, I, I think the governments, uh, they did, have not put their acts together to enable the young people. If they can, they spend so much money on their tuition. After they graduate, what are the opportunities for them? Unless we empower them, the income inequality will get worse. My question for you is, as a Nobel laureate, what can you advise, using your influence, advise the governments to change the situation? Thank you. Can, what can you advise uh, about uh, how to ensure that money goes not in financial speculation but in real value creation? All yeah. that wealth. <laughs> um, in, in, in a way, I, I think the obvious answer is probably the right one here. Uh, that uh, you, you should uh, give great advantages to people who uh, give money to charitable activities. 
But that's, of course, only the beginning of thinking about it, because uh, there are... Well, what, what do you do about people who, who give to a bogus charity? Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem quite right to say, oh, that then if it's found out that the charity is bogus, you should uh, actually regard that as taxable income. Whereas you would say it should be a tax-free gift if it's given. Uh, the, the example of the American heroes, I think, is, is a very telling one. That uh, the two people who are generally at the very top of the Forbes list, uh, and any of you who have looked at the Forbes list of wealthy people will be, uh, would be aware that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have stayed in the top three or four year after year. And that seems completely inconsistent with the picture I was giving you of uh, the random walk of uh, people's wealth jumping around by uh, considerable percentage points year by year, up and down. Uh, but of course, there wasn't time to get into the detailed structure of these things where plainly uh, some people, having made their lucky pounce, uh, had, had their wealth multiplied by 10 or something like that, then followed safe policies, which are easier for the very rich. The remarkable thing is that there isn't very much of that. But they, the, not only have they done that, but they have also given away a great deal of money, uh, which do, uh, doesn't, of course, show up in the forms lists. So I can't tell what they would have had if they hadn't given it away. But I, I still come back to, to the basic idea that uh, if money is given away, uh, and I want to say to, to deserving causes in some way. But I think that's very difficult to make effective. That, uh, that then you should deduct it. But I, I think one aspect of this, or a convenient way of doing it, is to replace the inheritance tax or estate tax with the tax on recipients. Because uh, you know, uh, inheritance is a form of transfer, of giving. So you'd think that if the principle is simply that if you give money away, uh, that's not taxable. Um, uh, it seems to completely contradict having an inheritance tax. Uh, and I, I, I actually think and, and many, other, many economists do as well, that it makes more sense to tax the recipient rather than the donor. Mm. But I, I think that's part of the, the answer to what was asked. Any other question in the room? Yeah. Uh, no. uh, I think the microphone will come to you. If the mountain comes, it doesn't come to... Thank you, Sir James. Um, my name is Nick Stoop. I'm self-employed here in Singapore. Uh, one question that I have is really with regards to a national redistribution of wealth versus a global redistribution of wealth, and whether you believe when it comes to global redistribution of wealth, uh, philanthropists maybe do that more efficiently than governments. Just want to get your thoughts on those two points. Thank you. Uh, such figures as I've seen, which are, are claims by particular charities, so, so they may not be all that reliable, are, are that uh, total philanthropic giving by the wealthy is, is not all that great. It's, uh, uh, the U.S. has a better record than most countries, but even there it seems to be only a few percent of, of their wealth. Uh, and uh, so I think that's 
part, part of the answer to, to this, although it's a little bit indirect, but uh, of course, global taxation instead of country based taxation is very attractive. And uh, I think it's great that it's been brought into the, the, the agenda of thought now by, by some charities that there, there might be some, some global taxes at least might, be begin, might begin to be thin end of an interesting wedge. Of course, the European Union has had uh, continuing difficulties. In principle, it should be moving towards such a, a principle. But uh, uh, then it, it, it comes down to being concerned about uh, macroeconomic management and how, how that can be done if you really put the whole tax system on a global basis. So probably not in your life. Probably not in mine. Right? You, you mentioned twice, uh, Mr. Piketty, in your speech, uh, do you care to give any comments on the work that he done, did and uh, the conclusions he drew? Uh, I mean, uh, he, he is in favor of, a, of a, a, a redistributing capital, yeah. ideally within the world, right. and so am I, yes. I mean, I mean it is... Uh, so you come to uh, I mean, they're almost <laughs> irresistible. <laughs> But, uh, but I have a different view as to the cause of the inequality, let's say. That I, was very clear, yes. I, I think that's the, the main difference between them. He's done more work on this than I have. Mm -hmm. uh, I take one last question, a short one, and a short answer. Um, so James, thanks very much. My, my name is Hemant Amin. We run a family office here. Uh, my question is, um, do you have any comments on the Scandinavian model, in particular uh, Denmark? Um, I was there recently and there seemed to be a very high rate of taxation, I think 50, 56%, uh, a very happy society. They rank among the happiest people in the world and they have the highest compliance rates in the world for paying taxes and they haven't lost the entrepreneurship. They have the top companies in the world makes um, Lego, etc. Uh, do you think that combination of factors is about right for the world to follow? Thank you. Yeah, I had, had the opportunity of asking a senior civil servant from the Danish Ministry of Finance if they had a, a, a big problem from emigration. Because of course you would think that in a, a, a highly taxed country that uh, a, a lot of the people who would be expected to pay a lot of the government's tax revenue would leave the country. Uh, he assured me and the others in the audience at the time that uh, there was actually very little of that. And uh, I, there don't seem to be the sort of famous emigrants that Sweden, for example, certainly had, and France now has. Uh, so, so if you compare current French experience where they've increased tax rates and, uh, and a number of famous people have promptly gone to well, Russia as a tax haven, extraordinary, but, uh, uh, which is the other way around from the, the usual of Russians coming to Britain as a tax haven. But uh, I, I, I think that's sort of uh, part, part of the answer that uh, countries seem to be different. Uh, their populations seem to have a different response to, to, to things like this. Uh, if you look at the various European countries, while Denmark is the one that is most heavily taxed, it's over 50% of the GDP going through uh, the government budget. Uh, others are very close. So it's not the only example that's demonstrating to the world that it seems to be 
Okay. So I, I think it's always a good idea to remind people that uh, uh, the Danes seem to be happy. On the other hand, uh, I mean, you must ask that there are Swedes here. I ask them whether the Swedes are happy. Very happy. Good. At least one voice is confirmed. Uh, so James, I think we have to stop it here. Uh, it's always difficult to summarize in uh, a lecture like this, but I would say, uh, for me personally, I um, I wrote down three things, and they're always I always pick things that are perhaps not that important. But first of all, I was very impre very impressed by the clarity with which you sort of treated the income and uh, wealth inequality, uh, the, cl the clarity with which you separated it out and still made the links between the two, and how uh, measures. Uh, to change perhaps that inequality uh, will have to be different uh, depending on wealth and income equality. Secondly, I was actually surprised that rich people don't have a uh, return of more than 4%. Uh, I have to say the endowment of SMU is better managed. <laughs> and thirdly, uh, I was very happy as a president of the university that you made a plea for more philanthropy. If anybody of you among you is rich or wealthy, we're always willing to uh, talk to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>